I'm Caitlin from Follow the Camino and One Foot Abroad, and this is Shane. Shane O'Mara is a professor of in experimental brain research at Trinity College Dublin, the University of Dublin. He is a principal investigator in and was director of the Trinity College Institute of Neuroscience, and one which is one of Europe's leading research centers for neuroscience. He's also a Wellcome Trust Senior Investigator and Science Foundation Ireland Principal Investigator. So thank you so much, Shane. Delighted to be here. <laughs> so um, Shane has written this incredible book um, in praise of walking, um, and it's got a whole bunch of, <laughs> it's got a whole bunch of really interesting pieces about how walking is good for you and how walking is good for communities as well. So um, we are going to start with a conversation on happiness. Um, obviously, uh, as we're filming this, it's a bit, bit of a challenging time in the world, um, but I'd like to talk a bit about how walking can increase happiness and make people feel better. So I, I think let, let's just step back from walking just for a, a second and uh, ask the question what it is that our bodies are designed for and what our brains are designed for. Um, and I think a, a reasonable answer is trees don't have brains, hedges don't have brains, grass doesn't have brains. And this is because these biological uh, things don't move around in the world. Whereas uh, animals that do move in the world, like ourselves, do have a brain. And you need a brain in order to act on the world. Uh, so our bodies are designed for movement. And we've been selected by evolution over aeons uh, to be able to engage in fluid movement. And one of the things that movement gives us is a sense of well-being. Uh, why? Because uh, uh, there are lots of bodily systems and brain systems that talk to each other, that are in dialogue um, with each other and with the environment we're moving. And they're quiescent when we're not. Uh, and our natural evolved form of movement is walking. Uh, and it's unsurprising that people feel good when they've had a good walk. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, humans are one of the only animals that walks, or only mammals that walks on two legs, is that right? That's correct. Uh, we're a very unusual species and we do something really strange. Uh, so if you look at a kid, uh, you know, in the, let's say, six or nine months after birth, it's crawling around on four limbs, uh, it's hard to fall over when you're on, on four limbs, you're in a very stable position. Uh, and uh, what we do at around about, you know, let's say nine, 10 months of age, we, we learn to sit up by ourselves, we pull ourselves into a variety of different positions. And then scarily at around about, let's say 12 or 14 months on average, uh, we pull ourselves upright and we totter forward. And we've gone from a stable to a very unstable position. And we remain in this unstable position for the rest of our lives, uh, which is a, a transition that no other species engages in. But that frees our minds, frees our hands. Uh, the way we look at the world, the way we interact with the world changes forever after that point. So one of the things that uh, people feel when they're with others in groups that are walking for the same purpose is what's known as a sense of exuberance. Um, the name the psychologists give to it, but in essence what it is is the feeling of the merging of the ego with the group. Um, and people feel as a kind of a certain dissolution of the self and a merging of the self with the larger entity uh, that they're part of. And unsurprisingly, this comes with other interesting feelings. So not alone do you feel like your ego is kind of dispersed among everybody else and everybody else feels the same with you, your feelings of happiness and well-being during that uh, go up as well. Uh, a really, really remarkable phenomenon. Difficult to study, um, but uh, efforts have been made where you, you give people questionnaires about uh, times they've been at concerts together. Uh, you, you sample people while they're out on walks using mobile phones and this kind of thing. And uh, the, the experience that people report during this is quite different to the experience that people report when they're out walking by themselves or with you know a friend or two or with with the family being part of a larger group is, is a very different experience absolutely and that is something that we hear a lot from the people who do walk the camino with us is that they they feel just a a totally different sense of being connected to a whole bunch of people emotionally and spiritually in some cases um, it's very interesting to see. I was just going to say, I think there's something interesting going on in that, uh, which 
uh, I would love to have as part of a research project. I'm sorry, I'm going to throw in my, my research uh, piece here. So uh, when people are walking, one of the things that, uh, especially when they're walking in common direction together, uh, the experience of walking is one of, of what psychologists refer to as flow. Uh, you have the experience of mastery and you feel like you can continue doing whatever it is that you're doing for very long periods of time. And the experience of flow is something that's commonly reported by sports people. Uh, when the, it's, it's what you might refer to as being in the zone <laughs> uh, when you know, you, you're kind of almost at the limit of your performance, but you've got this. Uh, so it's, it's motoring along very well. But I think what might happen in pilgrims also is they have the experience of flow from uh, uh, the mastery of the walking. The body has adapted to it. Um, they're making connections with the group that they're part of. But I think there's another piece that's thrown in, uh, which is the feeling of awe, uh, which is uh, the, this kind of feeling of transcendence that people get uh, when they're part of a larger group um, and uh, when they're focused on something uh, external to themselves. And, and we report this when we're in nature, for example, uh, these kind of transcendent feelings of well-being when you're exposed to the beauty of nature. Um, but pilgrims very commonly report feelings like this as well. So I, I actually think there's two different things going on there. And I'd love to investigate this in a bit more detail. And that actually links quite well to um, another thing that I was going to talk about. And that is the way that we measure different levels of happiness. So um, in your book, you mentioned a couple of different studies, specifically around being outside in the outdoors. Um, and there were a couple of, there were several studies actually that talked about how being outside, being in the outdoors can increase cortisol levels in your saliva, which no, decrease. decrease, decrease, decrease. And that means that people are less, less stressed than outside. Exactly. So uh, cortisol is an amazing uh, hormone. Um, it's... Uh, uh, surges in the hour before you waken in the morning is uh, prepares you for action uh, and it's a hormone that's essential to living but it's also the primary uh, human stress hormone so one of the things it does is it stiffens up your blood vessels it mobilizes energy and this is why there are more heart attacks point, reported in the in the morning on wakening uh, than there are at night for example when the what's known as the cortisol relaxation response has kicked in so the level of cortisol drops in your blood and in people who aren't stressed, what's supposed to happen is a diurnal, so over the course of the day, change in cortisol levels so that it peaks in the morning and remains stable through the middle of the day and it should fall in the evening. People who are stressed have a blunted relaxation response. Their cortisol is high in the morning and it doesn't drop much in the evening. Uh, but my sense is that in people who are engaging in these kinds of long extended uh, periods of exercise where they're away, from the concerns of everyday life, that they should have a reinstatement of the normal blunting of cortisol in the evening. So there's, and of course, we know that people report their stress levels fall when they're away from their normal context uh, and they're out in nature. So having these periods of being switched off uh, where you escape these kinds of, of uh, intrusive phenomena, which we welcome, you know, we love them and we hate them at the same time, is, is very, very good for us. Absolutely. And so that probably then links to overall happiness, doesn't it? Being outside, feeling that sense of regeneration that we get from walking and walking together with people and being outside. I think actually it's worth thinking about happiness just for a moment because uh, uh, happiness is a kind of an in the moment emotion. Um, and when you, you measure what goes on with people who are happy, you, you'll find, for example, if you ask people to rate their, their own self-reported happiness, you'll get some people that say they're eight today and they're eight tomorrow, they're uh, on a 10, a 10 point scale. And you'll get others who'd say they're four and a half. Uh, you know, they're not very happy. And we do know that there are people who are a bit more miserable uh, And this can be because they might be in chronic pain or they might just have uh, a personality disposition that drives them in that direction. But happiness is kind of a present-centered emotion. Um, uh, whereas there's a, a, another way of thinking about well-being, which cuts along with or is in parallel stream with happiness, which is the sense of meaning people have in their lives. Um, and happiness and meaning are not the same thing. And when you 
a look at meaning in terms of how it is focuses on people's lives or intrudes on people's lives often what you find is that people who report high senses of meaning are ones who are concerned with the future they're concerned with what has happened in the past and they're less concerned with their own sense of happiness so they, they, they uh, are kind of almost merging uh, their lives with the lives of others uh, now there's clearly overlap people who are happy tend to report uh, uh, they have a reasonable degree of meaning in their lives, but there's a lot of people who report quite a lot of meaning who are not happy. Um, you know, uh, if, for example, you think of the, the people who are working on the front line today, um, they're not going to be particularly happy uh, because they're dealing with a terrible human tragedy, but they're going to experience very high sense of meaning because what they're doing is contributing uh, to the welfare and lives uh, of others. So it's, it's worth just thinking about these two things being not quite the same. They overlap a little. Um, and my sense of, again, just focusing on pilgrims for a moment, why do you undertake a pilgrim walk? Well, part at least of the reason has to be that you're devoting yourself to a community of others and you derive a strong sense of meaning from being part of that community and from the belief system that revolves around it. And that's a very good point, that sense of purpose and meaning in your life. Um, when you're doing a long walk, regardless of why you're doing uh, the Camino, for example, if you're doing it for spiritual reasons or for the personal challenge, you've still got a sense of joint purpose and, and something yeah. that you are trying to achieve. And that's the key word, actually, is the word joint. That uh, even if you're doing the Camino by yourself um, as a lone pilgrim, you still have, are participating in an imagined community. Um, and uh, that is a really key component of wanting to engage in this kind of pilgrim experience. Um, that uh, you're doing it because you feel a part of something greater than yourself. In other words, something that gives your life meaning. So just to, to kind of sum things up, um, thanks so much for all of those answers so far. Do you believe that walking makes people happier? Yes, I do. <laughs> I, I think I, there, there are two ways of looking at, at it. Walking uh, can help you be less unhappy because uh, it reduces the likelihood uh, of you succumbing to things like major depressive disorder. Um, and, and we know this from, I, and I cover many of the studies in my book, that people who are more active, who engage in more walking steps per day are less likely uh, to become uh, subject to major depressive disorder. But there's clearly, at the other side of it, uh, a sense of elation uh, and a sense of well-being that people get from engaging in lots of regular walking. And again, think about that long walk out of Africa that uh, humans did uh, on those multiple occasions a uh, hundred odd thousand years ago. Uh, people who didn't like walking didn't leave. Um, those of us <laughs> who... Uh, we're, uh, are descended, we're descended from uh, our, our ancestors, who are the ones who wanted to walk, who were able to walk, who got a benefit from walking. If you found walking painful, troublesome, or something that you dreaded doing, probably didn't get very far. Um, but as you know, we humans have spread all over the, the planet, from uh, out from Africa, all over Eurasia, uh, down into uh, the Asia Pacific. Uh, areas around the, the Arctic Circle. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I think it does. <laughs> to summarize in a, a non loquacious way. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, we'll end this video here and uh, we will be back with a few more videos on different ways that walking impacts our lives. Thank you so much, Shane, for joining us. Delighted to. Thank you.